Well, good evening, everybody. How are we doing tonight? We're doing well. Welcome back to Sunday School Week 2. And we are in uh, week two of our topic on Pauline theology. And uh, I want to encourage you that if you are with us tonight and you were unable to be here last week, um, to go back and listen to last week's uh, week one as we kind of laid it out. The topic was Paul's world. And we talked about the context that Paul finds himself in, that Paul grows up in, and really the viewpoint that Paul's going, going to have. And, and uh, I, I really think it's going to help inform and give us context for each week. So every week is going to kind of reference somewhat back to week one, and every week's going to continually build on itself. So uh, the podcast is up, it's on YouTube, it's on Spotify, also Apple Podcasts, and so I encourage you to uh, connect with that each week. So last week, right, we talked about Paul's world. Uh, does anybody remember uh, the three different worlds uh, that Paul lived in, uh, and, and maybe the three contexts that we that we talked about. Uh, if you if you know, just just toss it at me. Uh, yeah, uh, Mediterranean culture, uh, Hellenistic culture, right? Um, what else? Yeah, Roman Empire. Yep, yeah, first century Judaism, um, or also called Second Temple. Uh, Judaism, right? And um, and so these are the, the the three worlds that Paul grows up in. He's he's immersed in. Um, and so uh, we're kind of going to reference tonight. And tonight's topic is really going to be uh, as we dive into Paul's theology, how his encounter with Jesus kind of flips all three of these worlds on its head, and and how radical. Paul's understanding of Jesus and revelation of Jesus is not only to himself, but is to his world. And I really believe uh, that as we look at Pauline theology, that it's not going to just be something that we go, man, that was cool for Paul, but it actually be something that's revolutionary and a revelation to each of our own lives. That'll actually be a revelation to each of us. So uh, tonight's topic um, uh, is going to be called the Christ event, and we'll get into what that means and that language in just a little bit, but the idea is going to be on the Christ event. Now remember, as we're looking at Paul's theology, and we're trying to understand Pauline theology, that Paul did not write us a theological book. Like Paul never wrote um, hey, this is a doctrine of God and the doctrine of Jesus, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, that this is the doctrine of justification, that this is the doctrine of sanctification, how it plays out. But rather, uh, Paul is writing letters to unique churches with unique situations and unique circumstances, and he's using his theology to speak into their unique situation. And so part of us understanding, man, what is Paul's theology is to look at the context of these individual churches and how Paul is applying his theology to these contexts so we can then discern and, and, and uh, uh, take out and seep out, if you will, his uh, his theology. So we're going to get uh, going to get at Paul's theology. If if we're going to get at Paul's theology, we have to look at the situations that he's writing to, and study from there. So, uh, what is the gospel that Paul preached? First Corinthians chapter fifteen. We're going to look a lot at uh, some of the letters tonight and. And different verses so that we can understand what is the central point. We're trying to, to understand what is the big idea, what is the, the, the centrality of Paul's theology. So Paul's gospel, he says this in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 8, as he's speaking to the church at Corinth. He says, I passed on to you what was most important and what was also passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and by the 12. After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, 
most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all of the apostles. Last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. And Paul's reminding the church in Corinth of the gospel that he had already passed on to them. And in fact, kind of how uh, this is sort of written line by line and kind of how it says uh, Christ died for our sins, just as the scriptures said. He was buried and raised from the dead on the third day, just as the, as the scriptures said. It, it, it has a cadence to it. In fact, it's believed that this is, is potentially an early creed that the church would recite. And he's saying, hey, just like I told you before, that this is what we believe. And he's listing it out. You know, as, as Christians, uh, we adhere to what's known as the Apostles' Creed, one of the, the longest and oldest standing statements of faith. It says, I believe in, in God the Father, and it lists out, all, I believe this. I be-. And so in that sense, what Paul's doing is he's, he's reiterating a creed to them, a creed and, and saying, hey, this is what we believe. This is the gospel uh, that we hold to. And what's important about this creed in 1 Corinthians 15, is the assertion that Jesus is both the crucified Messiah as well as the living, exalted Lord, whose resurrection by God was his vindication. Now, all throughout uh, Paul's letters, he's going to use a phrase as that Jesus is Lord. And this is going to be a phrase uh, even in, in the early church. And this phrase, Jesus is Lord, is in essence the entire confession of uh, the gospel in one phrase. Paul writing again to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says this. You see, we don't go around preaching ourselves. We preach... In essence, he's saying, this is the gospel. We preach that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we ourselves are your servants for Christ's sake, for Jesus' sake. And he says, Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, I think it's important. I think we all know this, um, but I think it's important uh, for us to remember and also understand that Christ is not Jesus' last name, right? Jesus is his name, and Christ means Messiah. And and so Jesus, uh, it's not, you know, it it wasn't Mary Christ, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't, uh, like he didn't inherit, it wasn't Joseph Christ. No, it was Jesus is his name, uh, and Christ is, is the attachment to him of saying he is Messiah. He's Yeshua, Messiah, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and in this phrase that, that kind of compacts Paul's gospel, if you will, Jesus is Lord, I want you to see it's going to be a collision of all three of these worlds. And the statement that we preach to you, Jesus is Lord, is showing the superiority of Jesus over each of these different worlds. The the collision with the Greek world and the Hellenistic world with Jesus, the Lord, is going to come against the polytheism of the culture in the Hellenistic culture. To say Jesus is Lord and Jesus is the Lord is to say he's greater than all of these other deities. Then there's the collision with the Roman world. With Jesus is Lord against Caesar is Lord. Because the Roman culture, like we talked about last week, is they they believed in this idea that, that, that Caesar is Lord. That Caesar reigns. And, and that Caesar is, 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 is attached and, if you will, the mediator between divinity and humanity and rules as the Lord over the earth. So, so this idea to declare, I come to you saying Jesus is Lord, is countercultural and even dangerous to 
the Roman Empire world that Paul's in. But, but this idea of Jesus Christ is Lord, there's a collision with Judaism where Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And the Messiah Jesus is Lord. That he's saying, hey, this, this hope that we've been waiting for is Jesus. And, and, and Paul's gospel collides with these three worlds. Not just, I, I want to say that the gospel, the idea that Jesus is Lord collides with our world. And if it doesn't collide with our world and there be a friction even in our own life to affect how we live in our current circumstances, perhaps we have not got the revelation that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. In the gospel, all of Paul's worlds are flipped upside down. This Jesus that Paul is speaking of, this Jesus rightly shares in the devotion and honor due to the one true God, the God of Israel. And Jesus is the proper recipient of the worship wrongly paid to any other so-called lords and gods such as Zeus, Apollo, and of course, the emperor. And so this idea that Jesus is Lord summarizes Paul's gospel message. But nowhere more graphically and succinct is Paul's gospel on display than the infamous verses that are going to be found in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. I could encourage you to memorize any section of scripture. I would encourage you to memorize Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 11. And and this early hymn of the church is is often uh, referred to as Paul's master story. That, That what Paul is writing is Paul is writing a graphic expression of what the gospel is. Paul writes Philippians 2, verse 6 through 11. He says, though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges, took the humble position of a slave, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And here we find the explicit rationale for the confession that Jesus is Lord. This early creed, this hymn, this song is borrowing language from Israel's devotion to Yahweh as the one true God and Lord. In fact, uh, it, it mirrors the language in Isaiah 45, verses 22 and 23. When uh, Isaiah 45, 22 and 23 says, Let all the world look to me for salvation. This is Yahweh speaking. For I am God, there is no other. I have sworn by my own name, I have spoken the truth, I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will declare allegiance to me. So when Paul 
is writing this, that Jesus Christ is Lord and that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. He's making this radical declaration that, that Jesus is not just a man that, that God ordained and anointed, but Jesus is God in whom we will turn our affection and bend our knee and our tongue towards. And through this connection and language, we find the exalted Jesus in on the divine side of the great divide between God and humanity. And in this narrative in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 11, uh, is known as Paul's master story. And so if we're looking at situations and how Paul is approaching unique um, uh, moments and unique problems in the churches, he's coming to the table with this master story in mind. We see it over and over and over and over again. When Paul is writing to different churches, and we'll look in just a moment, even how this, he's writing it right now, and he's applying it to a unique situation. And Paul's coming to the table with this viewpoint that this is who Jesus is, and that this is the source of our of our salvation, but also the shape of our salvation. It sets the source of the believer's salvation in Christ's incarnation, death, and exaltation. But it is also the shape that the believer is meant to take as we participate in the Christ event. We might say that this passage is Paul's master story as it shows the clearest example of Paul's telling of the gospel. But what's interesting 
is that Paul is not just giving us a theological statement and saying, hey, here's what you believe. He's not giving us a creed alone. He's not telling us the source alone. He's not giving us a theological statement on its own. Rather, it is a theological statement used to show the Philippian church is meant to be shaped in a certain way. That there is a shape of the Christian life. See, Paul has this understanding that there is a source to Jesus is Lord, but there's that, that, that revelation affects us in a way. But not just that it affects us where we have a belief in something, where we have words that we profess, but it actually affects our life to where our life is reshaped. have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had. Now we get to verse six, though he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. And Paul is approaching a place of division and he's coming with the master story, with the Christ event and saying, that this event, Christ's death, his resurrection, has changed how we interact with one another. That this event changes how we speak to one another. That this event changes how we uh, deal with one another. No longer do you put yourself ahead of others, but because of the Christ event, you now have to shape your life around the Christ event. That he's going, Jesus didn't think Equality. He was God, but he didn't think that, that, that his godliness made him better than someone else. So he became a slave. He became a human. He cast, he, he, he set aside, he emptied himself. The Greek there is this word kenosis, that it's the self-emptying of God, that he had these divine privileges, but he did not use them. That he did not embrace them, but instead he embraced humanity. And Paul's saying that the source of your salvation is also the shape of the Christian life. Because the shape of the Christian life is meant to follow the source of the Christian life. See, we, we can't talk about Pauline theology without talking about how theology shapes us. See, if our belief in Jesus does not shape us into the Christ event, into the master's story, I, 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 I would submit to you that we have not had this revelation of what we're going to look at in just a moment, what Paul has from the source. For Paul, it's not simply enough to trust in the source. You have to take on 
the shape of the source. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to talk on this theological term. And the term is called cruciformity, which is where we are shaped into the form of the cross. And what Paul is trying to get the churches to see is that, yes, we have a source, but we have to take on a shape, and the shape of the Christian life looks like the cross. So in essence, what happens is the Christ event becomes the hermeneutic that Paul uses to look through everything else. And we talked um, in uh, the first session of Sunday School of how to read and interpret the Bible. We talked a lot about hermeneutics and, and how we are interpreting and all of us are interpreting in some way or another. But what Paul does is the Christ event changes how he interprets everything. In fact, uh, Paul, as we, as we learned last week, was a good Jew. He was a, a learned Jew. But Paul would never read the Jewish scriptures in the Old Testament the same after the Christ event. After Paul has this encounter with Jesus, that through the Christ event, the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, Paul's going to read the Old Testament differently. Lewis Martin noted, that for Paul, the text of scripture no longer reads as it did before the coming of the gospel. And Paul finds in the Old Testament language that he's going to use. He finds uh, language for a prefiguration of the church and the people of God and the nation of Israel. That is, that, that there's going to be people who confess that Jesus is Lord and, and he's going to find a, a prefiguration of the church in the Old Testament as he sees what the Christ event does for Jews and Gentiles. Scripture shapes Paul's understanding of the community of faith and the experience of the church community, but it is all done through this event, the Christ event. Now, there's a distinct difference that I want us to see between Paul's teaching Jesus is expecting the moment that it's going to change, that the kingdom of God is going to be inaugurated. And Paul is looking back at that event, that this decisive event of God's action, of God acting is the Christ event. For Paul, this decisive act of God has already taken place in Jesus. And I, I, I can't hit this home anymore that Paul's theology is rooted in the Christ event. It's rooted in this moment. 
please don't misunderstand me. Jesus' words and teachings are vital for our Christian life. But Paul's understanding of the Christ event was so revolutionary, and that is the center of how he approaches situations. When Paul's dealing with the division of Philippians, he doesn't approach them with the Beatitudes. Jesus said, do this. He's approaching them with the Christ event and said, this is what Jesus did. This is how Jesus changed it. This is how Jesus embodied it and also invites us into this. So let's look at four areas that the Christ event is presented in Paul's letters. The first event, we're going to look at Paul's call. Uh, we called this last week Paul's transformation. On the road to Damascus. A lot of times it's called Paul's conversion. But for Paul, the Christ event, Jesus is not about him converting away from Judaism to Christianity. Why? Because Jesus is the Messiah. He is the Christ. This wasn't a conversion for Paul. This was a transformation of his life. And what caused Paul's radical transformation? It was him encountering Jesus on the road to Damascus. If you want to read uh, firsthand Paul's transformation on the road to Damascus. It's in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. But, but as we're looking at Paul's theology, let's look how Paul actually writes about it and what Paul actually says. And he writes in his letter to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I receive my message not from human sources. No one has taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Underline that word, revelation. I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. You know what I was like when I followed the Jewish religion. How violently, how I violently persecuted God's church. I did my best to destroy it. I was far ahead of my fellow Jews in my zeal for the traditions of my ancestors. But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvelous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me. Underline that word to reveal. It pleased him to reveal his son to me so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Ooh. I just messed up there. Demons in this microphone, cast them out. That's a joke. I thought that was funny. But. Instead, I went into Arabia and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Now notice, Paul doesn't argue his case on the contents of the message. In Galatians, what he's doing is he's writing to them because the church at Galatia are questioning his apostleship. That there are people uh, that have, uh, the scriptures have wormed their way into the Galatian church that are going, uh, hey, you don't need Paul. Paul's inferior. You don't, you don't need him. And so Paul isn't, isn't making a case on the contents of his message, but rather on the source of his message. Paul is making his, his arguments that, that, hey, 
uh, my, 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 my message has come from a source. And, and he says this in the New Living Translation puts it, the direct revelation from Jesus Christ. Paul is saying that he's an apostle because he has direct revelation. In the original language, Paul uses a significant choice of words. And in verse 12, he uses the noun revelation. And in verse 16, it's used in the infinitive position to mean to reveal. And and the Greek word is this word apocalypse. Apocalypheos. <laughs> Apocalypheos. I'm going to write it for you. Ooh, why is this not working? Oh. No, it's not right. It's, it is somewhat right. Apocalypheos. And, and, and this Greek word apocalypheos is actually where we get our word apocalypse from. And an apocalypse is a, is a revelation. And, and, and what Paul's doing is he's saying, I had this apocalypheos. Apocalypheos. And there's this revelation. And to describe, uh, Charles uh, Couser said this, to describe this event, Paul's transformation as an apocalypse not only underlined its heavenly authority, but also implied that this apocalypse, this revelation, had eschatological significance. That is, is the key with unlocked, which unlocked the mystery of God's purpose for creation, the keystone of the whole arc of human history is on this event, this apocalypse, this apocalypheos, this revelation of Jesus Christ. See, the Christ event goes much further than the personal experience of one individual. Paul's, Paul's uh, his own revelation that took place from the Christ event where Christ encountered him goes beyond just a personal level. It is in this event, it's in the Christ event that all of human history has been changed. Because this idea of apocalypheos is so important because the second one, look, is the dawn of a new age. <clears throat> How did this apocalypheos, when it encountered Paul, affect him? See, apocalypse might be somewhat of a foreign word to us, but it's an important word for first century Jews. It's an important word for Second Temple Judaism because apocalyptic literature was a unique form of writing in this time. Around 200 BC, there is a form of literature. And when we talked on our first session of Sunday school on how to read and interpret the Bible, we, we hit on apocalyptic literature. But it was really popularized in 200 BC to the Jews as, as a way of understanding uh, the political and the social crisis that they found themselves in and the hope for a new age. That it was this type of writing emerges from a time period where the political and social crisis is so bad for the Jews that it seemed impossible for a solution to emerge out of their present. And so these apocalyptic writings with their visions and their images and their symbols and their numerology and the beasts and this and that emerged as a way to make sense of the chaos and a way to have hope for the next age. There's a distinguishing feature in apocalyptic writing because apocalyptic writing the apocalyptic outlook is 
in the language that, that, that uh, deals with time in two ages. That there's two ages to this time of an apocalyptic writing. There's the present that we are in, which is the old age. And then there's the moment of God's intervention, which is going to be in the future. And that will be the new age, the new time. An apocalyptic writing uh, an apocalyptic understanding and the understanding that, that Paul would have uh, for, for as they're awaiting for God's intervention is going to be divided into the old age and the new age. And uh, the old age is a time of oppression. Evil is running rampant. But there was this hope that, that once God intervenes, that God is, is, that this might be how things are now, but God is going to intervene. And when God intervenes, we will step into the new age, the new time, which is a time of vindication. It's a time of God's rule. It's a time where the kingdom of God is no longer at hand, but the kingdom of God is among. The kingdom of God, that God intervenes. And Jesus, as he's talking about uh, that, that the kingdom of God is at hand, and this is what the kingdom of God is like, that it is, it is not far off. He's, he's standing in this understanding, looking forward. And people understand that, that, that this kingdom, when the kingdom of God comes, God has intervened. And Paul is going to use the apocalyptic perspective and adapt it in light of the Christ event. Because for Paul, God's moment of intervention happens in the Christ event. That Jesus is God's intervention into the oppression, into the evil. That, that, that Jesus inaugurates through his death, burial, and resurrection, inaugurates the kingdom of God. See, the Christ event for Paul is the apocalyptic event. The Christ event for Paul is his apocalypheos. It is the revelation. It is the defining moment of history that actually splits history. And just thinking through our current, how we keep calendar. But, but it actually splits history for Paul. The death and resurrection begin God's promised new age. Paul inaugurates, I'm sorry, Jesus inaugurates a new creation the beginning of God's transformation of human history in the universe. And when Jesus returns, the transformation will be complete and the old age will come to an end. Meanwhile, there's a reworking of this timeline, if you will, where the present time is also a time of overlap between the two ages. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. 
Paul's writing, he says, these things happened to them as examples for us. They were written down to warn us who live at the end of the age. And, and he's coming from this apocalyptic understanding. And Paul's view of the two ages as revelation almost happens. You have the old age. You have the time of oppression. You have the time of, of evil running rampant. And the Christ event happens. The Christ event inaugurates the kingdom of God. The Christ event starts the new age that is yet to come. And we now live at the end of the old age because of the apocalypheos, because of the revelation that has started the new age. We live at the end and await the consummation of it all. When Christ returns, it will end the old age and it will continue and be the fruition and, and the, the realized kingdom of God. This is where in our, in our whole class on eschatology where we talked uh, for a couple weeks on inaugurated eschatology and realized eschatology. Inaugurated eschatology is we're living where the kingdom of God is present, but it is not yet. That it is already in our midst, but it is not yet fully into fruition. And so we live in between these two ages. That's why when Paul says in Colossians to fix your sights on the realities of heaven, not the realities of earth, where Christ sits at the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the reality of heaven, not the realities of earth. He's saying, think about the realities of the new age that we now live in, but yet we are still amongst the old age. Paul says that, that we're citizens, in Philippians chapter three, he says we're citizens of heaven, but Paul's a Roman citizen. He's living in the old age while also living in the inaugurated kingdom of God in the new age. And, and, and this apocalyptic scheme of his day has been adopted, modified, adapted, and it provides the framework in which Paul is interpreting the significance of the Christ event. For Paul, the Christ event changed everything. So when Paul is coming to the church of Philippi and he says, because Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to and he brings the Christ event to them. He's going, because this happens, you can't continue to live in the age of the world and treat each other how the world treats each other because you are not living in that moment because the Christ event changed everything. The third thing is, is Paul's offering an alternative perspective. And this alternative perspective is Christ crucified. Come on. Whoop. Did it die on me? Nope. <laughs> oh. We have some dead pixels or something. I don't know. Anyways, you get it. Perspective. <laughs> alternative purse. See, Paul's encounter with Jesus brought about a new perspective for Paul. It was a new way of understanding himself. It was also a new way of understanding the people of God. And the letters that Paul is writing 
to the congregations are letters to persuade them to adopt the new perspective brought about by Jesus at the Christ event. Paul opens his letter in, in the first letter in Corinth, and he's saying this, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. He says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. <clears throat> but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. But this new perspective, is to see that the cross is the power of God. Paul doesn't come to the churches with the world's norms for knowing God. Instead, he gives them one thing, Christ crucified. That, that this is what he says it is to understand the power of God, but also to be invited. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human knowledge, he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It's foolish. It's foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It's foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. And so we preach that Christ was crucified. The Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Paul argues that the reality of God can only be known through the message of the cross. That it is in the cross that the character of God is revealed. And we'll talk about this, I think we'll get to it next week. This in theology is known as what's a theophany, a revelation of who God is. That it's in the cross that we see who God is. But not only is the cross the source of our salvation, the cross is the shape of in which our salvation is meant to take. Jesus said, unless you pick up your cross and follow me. See, this cross for Paul is not only the source of salvation, it is the shape of our life. The Christ event is not simply the source of our salvation. But each of us are meant to have a death, a dying, a burial, and a hope of a future resurrection. A life shaped in the cross. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ 
and him crucified. Paul says, I seek to know nothing except for the crucifixion of Christ. Now, it's interesting here because in our context, Paul might would, we would might say, there's nothing that I want to experience more than the resurrection of Christ. But it's interesting, Paul doesn't mention anything about the resurrection. But instead, he's showing that the cross was not a means to an end for God. But rather, the cross is a part of the revelation of who God is. And in the words of Paul, in essence, what he is saying is that to know God is to know the crucified Christ. That, that, that to know who God is, is to know who Jesus, the crucified Messiah, is. We've, we've got to understand that Good Friday is not simply the problem for which Easter is the solution. Because as Christ is risen, he is still the crucified Christ. That the risen Christ is not risen away from a cross, but the risen Christ is the one in which Paul is saying, I want to know this crucified one. He's speaking to the one that's been resurrected and still saying that, that this is the one that, that, that is crucified. And, and, and Christ's risenness and Christ's resurrection, he is resurrected as the crucified Christ. And we're going to talk about this in a couple weeks, about the cruciformed life that Paul is after in which he is telling the Philippians to live in. This life that is shaped after the cross and in the cross and by the cross. That our life is meant to be lived as a life on the cross. So that we might know the resurrected Lord as the crucified Christ. As Christ is risen, he is still the crucified Christ. Number four. Look at the shape of Jesus' life. What Philippians 2, 6 through 11 shows us is that the cross becomes the shape of the son's life. Because Jesus was God, he humbled himself. He went to the cross. And the Christ event functions as the hermeneutic, as the lens, as the prescription that Paul uses to address the issues in the congregation. And it brings us to this question of what is it in our life that the Christ event can address that if Paul was writing glad tidings a letter today he would do it from a place of going what how does the Christ e event affect how we treat one another how we love our neighbor how we treat our spouse how we treat people that don't look like us. How does the Christ event affect our life and address us? How might the Christ event be shaped in us? Not simply as a source. Not simply as a source of life to come, but a shape of life now. I mean, we let the Christ event change everything in our life. Like Paul let it change everything in his.
Because here's what I know about Paul's Christ event. Paul's Christ event is not meant to stay his event. Rather, we all must have our own apocalypheos, our own revelation, our own Christ event, our own apocalypheos, revelation of who Jesus is. I want to read and end with Paul's master story. Though Jesus was God, I wonder if we do this, we just all close our eyes. <clears throat> as I'm reading Paul's master's story, as I'm reading about the Christ event, I wonder if we could just invite the Holy Spirit to allow this not to be theology on a page, but to be a revelation to our life. That the same spirit that inspired the words we're about to read May that spirit and re-inspire it into our hearts and change us and allow fresh apocalypheos revelation into us. Though Jesus was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor, gave him the name above all other names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what is it when Paul is now approaching? We're going to look at uh, the next couple of weeks. We're going to look at a lot of different texts, and we're going to look at, at, at different ways in which Paul uses the Christ event to develop and look at issues, but also where, where we get thoughts on justification, sanctification, participation is one we're going to look at. Uh, next week, actually, there, next week is pastor appreciation. There won't be uh, any Sunday school next week, but the week after. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about participating in this life with Christ. We're going to talk about what it is the theophany of Christ, the Christophany, anthrophony, uh, ecclesiophany is another word. And so these ophanies, these revelations of what the Christ event does and means to us and shapes Paul's theological outlook. So we always end uh, Sunday school with uh, some questions because I am uh, great at muddying uh, the water. And so uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask and um, I will do my best to, to respond. It's Mike. At the uh, Christ event, mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. It would be like a Roman. Uh, it would have been the Roman emperor at that time. So the Romans I would assume. As no, no. Um, it's a great question. It probably, I mean, I don't, I'd have to go back and look at, relook at history. The, the point isn't so much of that, that like the, the historophity of it, the, the, his, the history of it doesn't, legitimize or delegitimize Jesus, his death and resurrection as the penalty, as the ultimate event. Um, that was simply just a remark about, uh, I mean, there is something about Jesus, even in our, our history. But, I, I, um, but it doesn't take away or add to the legitimacy of the event. You know? Yeah, 
No, I don't know. I'd have to, we learned that in high school. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know in that culture they had last names. You, I don't, there's nowhere in scripture uh, that they have last names. They're always attributed to places. Jesus of Nazareth, Joseph of Arimathea. Um, they, they weren't attributed, they, were, they didn't have, it's not like we have last names now. Um, uh, they were attributed from their locale, not uh, with, with a last name. I mean, there's not one last name in scripture, uh, to my knowledge. Paul of Tarsus. He wasn't, there is no last name. There, there isn't like a, we're, we're looking at that, like that just wasn't in their culture. You know what I mean? That wasn't like, no, it's Paul of Tarsus, where he's from. They're, 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 they're attached to, uh, or they're attached also maybe to their occupation, Matthew, the tax collector. You've got, um, uh, you got, you have different, uh, different ways. So, so a great point is so often we, 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 we can't help. It's just, and we always do, we just need to recognize is that uh, we bring our 21st century minds to reading texts that were written and even cultures that are much different than ours. So how revolutionary is the Christ event to Paul's world? It's, it flips it upside down. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I, I would I would say uh, names in Jewish culture carry a lot a lot of meaning. Yes, um, so it was very significant. Uh, some and, and in our context, you know, so my wife and I we felt like we wanted to give the names of our daughters as sort of like a a word over their life. You know, uh, a name that had meaning that attached to them. Not everybody does that, uh, but it is still is maybe a common common thing today. Any other questions? We're good? All muddied up. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so cultures, um, yes, 100%. Um, this might be a nuanced answer. The more privileged the culture, the less Jesus is seen on a cross. The more persecuted a culture, the more the cross means to those that are in suffering. And I, I think historically, um, so historically, Jesus is, is always presented on a cross as uh, the Reformation happens, as progress happens in, uh, around the world, uh, Jesus has somehow been taken off of that. But it, and, it's, and it's not been, it's been, it's, it, it, and from, from good intentions. So growing up, uh, we never had images of the of Jesus on a cross in our house. Uh, and the answer was, well, Jesus isn't on a cross anymore. I, I understand that. However, Paul says, I want to know the power of God and the power of Christ the crucified. Like he equates the power of God with Christ the crucified. And he's, he's referencing the, the, the cross in a present tense. And so um, I, I think a downside of us taking Christ off the cross is that we don't know what it's like in our context to suffer. We don't know what it's like to actually live a life shaped by the cross. Because we are and I'm not trying to downplay the resurrection because the resurrection, without the resurrection, we don't have the power, the cross finds its power in the resurrection. But you can't have one without the other. And sometimes we see the cross as a tool used to get to the actual good part. That this, the cross was a setback. The cross is not a setback for Jesus or for God. The cross is God revealing himself to humanity. The cross is 
for Paul is also Christ revealing, and we're going to talk about this next week, or two weeks from now, Christ revealing to humanity what humanity is meant to look like. So the cross isn't a side issue for Paul. It's not a side issue for, for God. The cross is the way we live our life now. That is the, sh- that, that is the, it's the source, but it's the shape that we take. Yeah. Does that answer that? Um, Jesus still bears the scars in his body from his crucifixion. It's always with him. He goes to Thomas, touch my hand, hand in my side. You can't have Jesus without the cross, even now. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it would be an apocalyptic understanding of how uh, the Jews in that time would uh, be 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 would use and kind of talk about their time. Yeah, like we we're living in the old age, the present, but there's a new age that's to come. It's the that is the kingdom of God. So Paul's understanding is that the Christ event happens in the old age, begins the new age, but continues until Christ returns. So there's an overlap in the old and the new. And you're going to see that as we look at Paul's language, you're citizens of heaven, not citizens of earth. Colossians chapter 3, which is what we talked about last week. I believe Colossians is a disputed letter, but... Chapter 3, since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of the earth. For you've died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all of his glory. You can see how the language of that fits perfectly into this idea that we are living uh, kind of in between these, we're living with the effects of sin still. Like the new age is here, but it hasn't been consummated yet. It's consummated at the return of Christ. So we did our series on eschatology. Um, I'm trying to think of an exact week that you could that would be good to maybe help us with some of this language. Week one, I think we talked about an inaugurated eschatology. Um, and then uh, the Pentecostal eschatology week, we talk about this because it's Pentecostals. The, the spirit being poured out is a big event that happens for us um, as we live in this, in this age, in this already not yet tension. Does that make sense? Maybe. <laughs> awesome. And if you have any questions throughout the week, you're more than welcome to email me or text me, and I'll be happy to do that. Uh, Let's pray out. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Father, we thank you. Thank you for every person. God, I pray that we will have a fresh revelation of the Christ event, that the the Christ event that Paul had, the revelation that he had, won't just be unique to him, but each of us will encounter the master story of Philippians 2, 6 through 11 in our life, and it will change everything about us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Everybody said, Amen. Thank you so much. Have a blessed night.